One of the best ways to fall in love is to just let it happen. The more you try to force something, the worse it gets and the quicker it falls apart. And to me, when it comes to reading things, it's less about you actively being involved and more about you creating an environment where the things that need to happen, happen naturally. When it comes to breeding aquatic isopods, there really isn't that much work on your end to be done besides, you know, making an environment where they won't get slaughtered in, a place where they can be happy. When talking about the life cycle, the lifespan of the isopods, typically they will live about a year, a year and a half with warmer temperatures, similar to Neocaridina shrimp. The warmer it is, the faster metabolism, and the sooner they die. So that's another reason I like keeping them room temperature because they already breed year round at room temperatures. So let's recap their life cycle. Reproduction begins with the male engaging in a guarding and caring behavior. This is to keep the female in place until fertilization is possible because there's only a short window uh, where that can happen, which is right after the female molts. So when it comes to trying to observe and see if breeding is happening, this is something you would see. You would see a male carrying a female underneath him, and that would be one way you would know, okay, it's about to go down. And we're not going to go into the details too much and all that, but all right, so we have the guardian. Then we have the female who's grabbed it, so you'll see a female crawling around. It's got a very obvious giant egg sac, a full marsupium, and those will be in there incubating for a couple of weeks, at which point, when it is done, the juveniles will be released from the marsupium as sexually immature little babies crawling around. They're so tiny, they're so cute. It only takes them about four to five-ish weeks to reach sexual maturity. So within about a little over a month, those fresh isopod babies could already reproduce on their own. So when you're starting your own colony, what this looks like, you put them in the tank. Maybe they're sub juveniles, maybe they're adults. Either way, you got that, let's say two week period of the isopods gestating. Then they're born as little miniature isopods, but you're probably not going to see them in that form unless you have it set up the right way so now we're talking about another week another two weeks before you start seeing them and then we got three-ish weeks until they're starting to have their own babies on their own so if you do the math even if you get the adults in and they're immediately having babies and stuff it could be another month or two before you really start seeing your culture explode and you know grow but also if we do the math, the exponential growth potential of an isopod culture is pretty impressive because they have so many babies and in a month, all of those babies that make it will be able to reproduce on their own. And that's why I've been able to spread the isopod agenda the way I have with a little space because this tank right here has produced thousands of isopods and likely produces, you know, hundreds to thousands of isopods every month. So the first thing you need to do is create an environment where the isopods can be happy and safe and in the mood to fall in love and make a family. Now everything I say could apply to almost any size tank. I mean you could like breed them in a shot glass or something. I personally don't want to do that. I think you know if you can do a five gallon a ten gallon come on that's beautiful just full of isopods and I, I am doing that right now. When setting up a place for the ice pods to breed in, there's a couple things that I personally love to include. One would be leaves. Really leaves are important to have in there just so there's a constant food source as that leaf degrades, as it starts to go through that natural process, the isopods will do as they do in nature collect on the leaves, eat off of them, and the babies will go over there and collect on the leaves and eat off of them. But if you're trying to breed a bunch, that doesn't mean that, oh, they have this leaf they're not gonna wanna eat. No, if you throw in a food in there and it's something that is palatable to them, they're going to eat it, they're going to appreciate that, and that is going to power your culture because I dump in tons of food every day into the isopod tank 
and it disappears for the most part. Some vegetables might take them two days, depending. Sometimes I throw in some soybeans. Those usually take a little longer. The broccoli, actually, that a giant piece of broccoli, it actually did get eaten in about 24 hours. So listen, a lot of things in nature, isopods included, they're opportunistic feeders. And when they are faced with more food than they need to just survive, they're like, hey, we got to take advantage of this opportunity. We have an excess of food. It's time to do the things that we do. Reproduce, get fat, and be happy. So when you're trying to breed things, you usually have to feed them a bit more because, you know, they're not going to breed when it's going to leave them emaciated and, <laughs> and nutrient deficient and struggling to survive. That's when you get things eating their own babies because they're like, this is not going to work. There's not enough food for me. There's definitely not enough food for me and 50 of all you old hungry mouths. So definitely feeding, not a big deal, nothing too much to stress about. They're not picky, but, you know, get a feel for how much your isopod culture can consume so that they won't be overfed. So feeding, like most things, just depends on your goals. If you're trying to breed them, then I'd feed them all the time as much as they can eat, you know, in a reasonable period without affecting the water quality. But if you're not trying to breed them, throw some leaves in there, wash them, enjoy them, feed them when you feel like it. The other thing I would include is as many rocks as possible because it's just nice for them to have a place to be safe, a place to eat and graze off of, and also it's aesthetically pleasing. It does the dual purpose though of if your isopod culture ever needs to become a temporary fish or fry holding spot they have a surefire place where they can go where they won't be eaten and this is especially relevant if you're doing this in like a 10 gallon tank because you know it's only a matter of time before that dedicated shrimp or isopod tank gets uh, visited by some fish i mean it's only a matter of time trust me i know Another thing I would definitely add is a sponge filter, not only because this is a great way to filter your tank without potentially sucking up baby isopods and decimating them into little pieces, but it also serves, especially if it's a coarse sponge, as a place for the pods to basically colonize. The baby isopods will stand there, eat detritus, bacteria, and all the other nice little micro foods that, that grow until they're big enough to venture out into the tank and take over. And a quick note about telling the difference between the two sexes, the sexual dimorphism with the isopods is pretty straightforward, at least from my kind of casual anecdotal uh, observations, which is that the males have these much bigger claws in the front, kind of have a broader body in general, and the females have a slimmer body towards the head and much smaller claws. So once you take some time to look at the isopods and they get big enough, the difference, in my opinion, is pretty obvious, so just keep a close eye out. So we got some leaves in here, we got some rocks. I like including a sandy substrate that they can dig around and dig into. It doesn't have to be the whole tank, but I think having a sand section in there is good. They definitely like digging in it and uh, kind of going in it. If they feel scared, they can kind of duck into the sand. And then of course some plants, some mosses, some stem plants, all the above, because they are active, they like to explore, they like to climb up and jump off things. And when the babies are born, they're going everywhere. They're all over the place. So the more surface area, the more rocks, the more things they can crawl under, just the more space you can create in the glass box that you have. It's not just a horizontal space, is vertical space too. So if you stack up enough rocks, if you got enough plants and you have tons of vertical space for them to crawl around and not feel too crowded. Now, when it comes to water parameters, again, this is very species specific and it's difficult to identify these guys for most people to the species level. But in general, when we're dealing with these North American or naturalized North American species like Acellus aquaticus, they're going to be pretty flexible when it comes to parameters. For temperature, you can do room temperature. I believe I have a North American species because they aren't Acellus aquaticus, in, in my opinion. And 
if there aren't cells aquaticus that really only leaves a few options that would realistically be obtained in the united states but the point is is that they are outside year round they can survive much cooler temperatures here in maryland it's already you know getting below freezing some nights and they're out there in the ponds and they're cool so in our aquariums where people are regularly keeping things at 78 degrees and warmer that is pretty warm for them to be experiencing all the time so i do think that will shorten their lifespan if you have them temperatures like that so i just prefer to keep them room temperature which ends up being anywhere from you know 70 to 76 depending right maybe even lower you know in the high 60s there's all sorts of varying opinions when it comes to ph and tds and all that i can only really speak for what i have personally which is the ph of like 6.6 .6 to 7 the highest i've ever measured is 7.2 you know these things really depend on the tank there's a lot of stuff you can put in the in your tanks that can affect it up or down and i don't really pay attention to that kind of stuff uh, i have pretty soft water from when i last measured it but as far as water parameters go, I think the most important thing is for them to be stable. The only time I've had an issue with losing the isopods is when I put them in a brand new tank or when I put them in a tank that suddenly has a water quality issue due to probably the fault of me doing something silly like overfeeding or taking out a bunch of plants at once and just kind of disrupting the whole ecosystem so i do think that when it comes to breeding and also keeping these guys having a tank that is developed or if you are setting up a new tank having a lot of plants and rocks and maybe a sponge filter from an established tank is going to be really helpful for preventing any kind of just mysterious deaths i do find the adult males like the bigger males do have a tendency to just kind of spontaneously die i think this might have to do with energy expenditure when it mating because they have to carry the female around and you know just mating shortens things lifespans a lot and if you're keeping them in a pretty big colony they might have the potential to mate with a bunch of females so i think that is why the bigger males i'm finding one or two every now and then just dead from a reason i can't really explain that's my theory as of right now especially since it's the bigger males so they probably have an advantage when it comes to mating things you might want to look out for so hydra and planaria now planaria like if you see one or two planaria i don't care that does not bother me i don't think it's a problem if you see like a hundred planaria then yeah get some no planaria knock those guys out i've used no planaria with the isopods we found that no planaria doesn't seem to affect the aquatic isopods negatively the planaria hasn't been that much of an issue the hydra i can't say if the hydra will necessarily kill any isopods or any baby isopods but i will say that it significantly affects their behavior and this is if you have like a bad hydro problem which i did have if the hydra is all over the damn place then it's going to be stinging the baby isopods and adult isopods and they're just going to want to not can deal with any of that basically they're like i'm out i'm under this rock catch me wherever that damn freaky hydra tentacled bullshit is not and so if you have a large hydro problem i would also smack them with the no planaria you can i think you can do like a half dose maybe even less um and it should take them out within like 24 hours i've done that and i think that no planaria isn't safe for snails personally i've done like smaller doses for the hydra and my snails have stuck around but it's just something to keep in mind that is definitely a risk you're taking if you have snails in there when it comes to tank mates when breeding i do keep fry in my isopod tanks but you want to make sure you understand the fry that you're keeping in there if i put killifish fry in there the killifish fry are going to get big enough to eat the isopods and unlike some other fish depending on the killifish that is not all killifish are like this because i can put procatopus in there and they're never going to bother the baby isopods but say i put um some gardener eye killifish in there those fry will get big enough to eat the isopods and they will hunt the baby isopods, go under a leaf, find them, eat them, stuff like that. So you don't want to put fry in there that one are going to get big mouths very quickly, but two are a uh, fish that actually will hunt things because the isopods are good at hiding, but some fish are good at hunting. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, shrimp and snails, that's a no brainer. 
rice fish fry keep in there and another thing is that even if a uh, tank mate isn't eating the baby ice pods it could affect their behavior i had a hydra problem in my breeding tank i didn't see 80 percent of the ice pods i normally saw threw some no planary in there instantly saw a billion isopods again like all was normal so just because suddenly they're gone doesn't mean that they're dead just because you put uh something in there and suddenly they're gone doesn't mean they got eaten but it could signify a behavioral change because isopods are very adaptive to their environment they're not just brainless creatures and once they get, kind of get the hint that there's a predator or something that just is a little bit sus around they're going to react accordingly and you will not see them <laughs> But the most important thing you could do is patience. There's absolutely no rushing this, and there's really no reason to rush it. They were going to take care of things, and there's not really much you can do to speed up or slow down the process besides giving them the best environment possible. Because you're not doing the breeding. You're doing absolutely none of the work. You're literally doing the bare minimum uh, that a good person should do, which is provide an environment where these living creatures can live out their lives as they would normally unimpeded by an unreasonable amount of predators disease starvation toxic water and general aquarist incompetence all right so really that is what you are tasked with keep them alive and happy that's it there's no breeding as a verb for you you're not breeding it you're just not executing. <laughs> uh, so just as a quick summary, breeding the isopods, feed them a little bit, get a feel for how much they can handle, what they like, build that relationship. There's no set guideline where it's going to be, oh, this is what every single isopod likes. No, put in the work, build a relationship with the isopods, with the tank they're in, figure out what they like what makes them happy i can show you the leaves the rocks and stuff i put in but you might be able to you know take oh maybe they don't like this there maybe they like that there oh they're hanging out a lot on that thing over there i should put more of that in there they like that that is what you should be focusing on so as far as my part on making the video the life cycle all of that is pretty simple pretty straightforward them breeding pretty simple pretty straightforward there's no water change trigger there's no real temperature trigger because at any reasonable room temperature in most places they're going to breed so with them the only thing you have to do is just provide an appropriate environment and with that you can breed thousands and thousands of isopods because i certainly have and i am not extremely competent i'm just able to keep them alive feed them and they've taken care of the rest and that's the isopod agenda because the more of us that are keeping the isopods in places where they can thrive the more isopods we make the more isopods we can spread and the more the isopod agenda can grow so thanks for watching this video get out there breed some isopods spread the isopod agenda find our super duke for secret elite uh, hard to get into exclusive discord and come in chat about the isopod agenda chat about whatever other aquatics amphibians spiders slugs uh, parasites and other ugly things that people think are cute ants plants whatever living life forms or things you've killed